Hey, what is going on everybody? Jerma here with kind of a different commentary today. This is going to be over... Uh, I'm not really sure what gameplay is going to be in the background. I'm actually talking into a black screen right now, so I'm not, I'm not really sure what's going to be there. But there will be a gameplay there. Whatever loadout I'm using, whatever uh, game it happens to be, that's what I'm doing. But uh, this video is going to talk about something that I've been thinking about lately, and it's a discussion video, so please chime in in the comment section if you have anything to add to this. And it's about the gaming industry plateauing, and how graphics engines and gaming in general is kind of at that area where there's not a whole lot else left to do. There's not a whole lot else left to innovate on. And we're going to talk about some points, uh, some counterpoints as well to argue this fact. I'm going to play devil's advocate to myself in a small regard. But first of all, let's, uh, let's bring up the fact that gaming... Let's talk about graphics engines first. So the graphics engines of yesteryear, going back to like the Super Nintendo and regular Nintendo. Or even if you keep going back to Atari. Well, I guess we'll start at Atari. Atari. So you had Atari, very, very basic graphics engine. I don't know if you can even call it that. I, there's like two blips on a screen for most of the Atari games. And then you went from Atari to regular Nintendo. Regular Nintendo had 8-bit graphics, and the change from the Atari to the NES was huge. It was astronomical. People had never seen anything like that before ever in their entire lives. And the same can be said from the NES to the Super Nintendo. The Super Nintendo was miles ahead in technology. Same thing for the Sega Genesis. And it seems that uh, we can keep going generation to generation here. You move on to the Nintendo 64. You move on to, like, Sega CD. And then you got the Dreamcast, PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, and then PS3. Everything, every generational jump has been an astronomical change until you got to the PS3 and the 360. When these two systems were being talked about, when the 360, the 360 came out first, when the 360 showed its first screenshots and showed its first gameplay demos and stuff, I, I was kind of let down. Maybe that's because I'm a child of the 80s and I saw this whole revolution of video games, but the Xbox to the Xbox 360, there was a, it was a jump, but it was such a tiny jump. It was like a little dude jumping over like a friggin' candlestick. What's the guy's name? Come on, come on, what's the guy's name? Jack B. Min Jack B. Nimble, Jack B. Quick, Jack jumped over the Xbox to the Xbox 360. Uh, that's how I felt. Textures looked kind of the same, uh, modeling looked kind of the same. It was in the same realm of graphics quality as the regular Xbox. Now that they're talking about the Xbox 720 and the PS4, are we gonna see a huge jump? Because guys, you gotta remember, it's been like 10 years since we've seen anything really, really innovatively huge, like graphics engine-wise, in the last 10 years. That's a long time. Especially considering the fact that from the Atari to the Nintendo 64 was like, holy crap, you're like blowing up a nuclear bomb in changes to graphics quality. And moving on to the next point here uh, about not just the graphics quality, Games in general are starting to plateau. We're starting to see the same storylines rehash themselves. We're starting to see way too huge sequel numbers. What are we on? Final Fantasy 75 now? Like, how, how far are things going to go before we see a really big innovation change in this industry? And I think it's happening. I really think it's happening, guys, at a much smaller level. I think it's happening at the indie level, at the independent level, because all these huge studios... They don't need to innovate anymore. They have all their franchises, they have all their ideas, and they have all their things locked down. But it's the little developers, the little independent developers, that have to strive to create amazing content. Otherwise, they're going to die. They're going to die off. I mean, how is Joe Schmo going to be able to make an indie platformer or an indie shooting game in his living room and be able to compete with Call of Duty or Battlefield? It's just impossible unless what you're making is a crazy cool new idea. And that's one of the reasons why I love Edmund McMillan so much, is because he's an independent developer that just does such wacky stuff. He's always creating these new crazy things. We got The Binding of Isaac from him, Super Meat Boy, Gish, and he's working on a new title right now called Mugenics, which I cannot friggin' wait for that game to come out, guys, because it's gonna be so cool, it's gonna be insane. I can't wait to play it. But enough of smoking this guy's ass. Smoke what? Smoking this guy's ass. What, what am I going to roll up his ass and smoke it? What am I talking about? Uh, tooting his horn is what I meant to say. <laughs> what? Uh, anyways, 
it, it, without stuff like that, without people like uh, independent developers like Edmund McMillan, uh, the industry really might plateau. It really might start to stagnate. But uh, that's where you guys come in. I'd love to hear what you have to say about this topic. Put it in the comments section below. Get a discussion going. Let's talk about the industry plateauing and if indie games can save us all. I guess that's that's the real meat potatoes point of this entire video. So uh, thank you everybody so much for watching. That's going to wrap it up here. Uh, whatever game I happen to be playing, I hope I won. I don't know. <laughs> I, the gameplay's not recorded yet, but I wanted to get this down. I wanted to get this commentary done because I wanted to talk about it really badly. So uh, thank you again, everyone, for watching. I'll see you all soon. And, of course, take care, everybody.